Hello and welcome back to Phil 210. There we go. What is critical thinking? Critical thinking is a process of active systematic thinking that involves analyzing, evaluating, and synthesizing information to make informed decisions and solve problems. The following are some key elements of critical thinking. Analysis. The ability to break down complex information into smaller parts and examine the relationships between them to identify patterns, discrepancies, or inconsistencies. Interpretation. The capacity to understand and explain the meaning of information, such as text, data, or images. Inference. The ability to draw logical conclusions based on the available evidence and consider alternative explanations for observations. Evaluation, the process of assessing credibility, relevance, and significance of information to determine its usefulness in making decisions. Explanation, the ability to communicate findings and conclusions effectively to others using clear, concise, and accurate language. Self-reflection, the ability to reflect one's own thought processes, biases, uh, and assumptions uh, to adjust one's thinking based on feedback uh, and new information. Open-mindedness, the willingness to consider multiple perspectives and be open to new ideas and information. Uh, creativity, the ability to think outside of the box and generate novel ideas or solutions to problems. Again, the basic key elements in critical thinking include analysis, interpretation, inference, evaluation, explanation, self-reflection, open-mindedness, and creativity. It also includes, last but not least, curiosity, the desire to learn and seek out new information to better understand the world around us. About the interview process, there are different types of interviews that are commonly used in different contexts, here are some of the most common types of interviews. Job interviews. These are interviews that are conducted by employers to evaluate a candidate's suitability for a particular job or position. Job interviews may be conducted in person, over the phone, or via video conferencing. Informational interviews. These are interviews that are conducted by job seekers to gather information about a particular industry, company, or job role. Informational interviews are typically conducted with professionals who have experience in the field of interest. Research interviews. These are interviews that are conducted as part of a research study, often gather, uh, gathering qualitative data about a particular topic or phenomenon. Research interviews may be conducted with individuals, groups, or organizations. Oral history interviews. These are interviews that are conducted to gather personal stories and experiences from individuals, often related to a particular historical event or period. Investigative interviews. These are interviews that are conducted as a part of an investigation or legal proceeding, such as police investigation or a court case. Media interviews. These are interviews that are conducted with individuals who are experts or have knowledge on a particular topic current event and are often conducted by journalists or reporters for print, radio, or television media. Performance evaluations. These are interviews that are conducted by managers or supervisors to evaluate an employee's performance, typically for the purpose of providing feedback or making decisions about promotions or raises. Counseling interviews. These are interviews that are conducted by mental health professionals, such as therapists or counselors, to help individuals work through personal or emotional issues. Interrogation interviews. These are usually conducted by members of, of a policing force, a government, a military, and or the judiciary. Additionally, it's important to understand how words are being used. For example, in legal parlance, hearsay. Hearsay refers to a statement made by someone other than the witness who is testifying and is being offered as evidence to prove the truth of a matter asserted. Hearsay is generally not admissible in court as it is considered unreliable and lacks safeguards of cross-examination and oath-taking. 
Speculation. Speculation refers to a statement or opinion that is based on conjecture rather than evidence or knowledge. Speculation is generally not admissible in court, as it is not based on direct observation or personal knowledge and may unfairly influence the jury or judge. Relevance. Relevance refers to the degree to which evidence is related to the matter at hand and is likely to prove or disprove a material fact in the case. Evidence that is relevant is generally admissible in court as it helps to establish the facts of the case and may influence the outcome of the trial. Evidence that is not relevant or is only marginally related to the matter at hand may be excluded by the judge. While speculation and relevance may be close to common parlance, hearsay may have a slightly different meaning in everyday usage. In common parlance, Hearsay may be considered synonymous with gossip, while in court it means that the witness is being asked to verify or give testimony about information that they did not personally see, hear, or experience. Again, hearsay is when someone's asked to give testimony on something that they were not actually present to, they didn't really witness. And again, um, it's difficult to have have protection of hearsay, uh, they can't, uh, the, the prosecutor or the defense is unable to directly question the individual or individuals that were actually there. And there's no protection of oath taking under those circumstances. Uh, so that's, that's quite generally considered inadmissible. The purpose of a courtroom is to actually ask questions of those who are present and gather that information together to make a case. Now, speculation is different than hearsay. Speculation is asking the witness to basically say what they think about something in terms of of their own ideas. Uh, it's when they're they're asked to kind of hypothetically suggest a scenario that they didn't really see happen or did not personally experience. So speculation is, again, uh, also not, not based on direct observation or personal knowledge, um, but it may unfairly influence a judge or jury. Relevance. Now, relevance is relevance is relevance. Uh, whether you're talking about your sources being relevant to a term paper or a research paper, whether you're talking about relevance of evidence in a courtroom, uh, the question of relevance is, how is that information or evidence related to the question at hand, related to the the inquiry that is, is currently existent? And again, um, evidence that is not relevant or is only marginally related to the, the subject may be excluded by the judge. Read technique. Uh, Reed technique is a method of interrogation that was developed in the United States in the 1940s by John Reed, a police officer and polygraph examiner. It has since become one of the most widely used methods of interrogation in the United States. There are a number of elements to the Reed method. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with the first, which is direct confrontation in which the interrogator confronts the suspect with evidence of their guilt and asserts that the suspect is guilty. Theme development. The, interrogator, the interrogator develops a theme that provides a moral justification for the crime that, and minimizes its seriousness. This is again a manipulative strategy in which the interrogator is basically saying, yeah, you know, uh, I can really understand why you would do what you did. Again, assuming the suspect's guilt and uh, trying to convince the suspect that they're on their side uh, if they just come come forth with uh, actually confessing. The whole point of the read technique really is, is to obtain a, a confession. Handling denials. Uh, if the subject uh, or the suspect denies their guilt, the interrogator interrupts those denials by the sub suspect and moves the conversation back to the theme of, uh, you know, basically we know you did it <laughs> and uh, it's okay. Just go ahead and confess, you know? So, so uh, they essentially ignore any pleas of innocence on the part of the suspect. 
overcoming objections. The interrogator responds to any objections raised by the suspect about this questioning method uh, by reinforcing that theme again, minimizing the seriousness of the problem, asserting the moral justification of the suspect in doing it. Uh, again, the whole point is to manipulate the suspect and to get a uh, confession. So continuing, there are, there are several steps to this process of wearing someone down, the procurement and retention of a suspect's attention. The interrogator uses various techniques to maintain the subject's attention and to focus on the theme, because as you can imagine, after a lengthy period of being badgered about uh, their guilt, whether they are guilty or not, uh, a, a suspect is bound to become a little bit uh, desensitized to the process. So the interrogator uses different methods to keep that from happening. Handling the suspect's passive mood. If the suspect becomes passive or resigned, the interrogator tries to maintain momentum and move towards a confession. Number seven, presenting an alternative question. The interrogator presents the suspect with an alternative question that suggests a more lenient view of the suspect's guilt. Uh, again, just working away at trying to get that confession. Detailing the offense. The interrogator gets the suspect to provide a detailed confession of the offense. And then after obtaining that confession, converting the confession, uh, the interrogator gets the suspect to agree to sign a written version of the confession and to provide additional details that can be used in court. This uh, method in the U.S. is is quite different than the current method being used in the United Kingdom, in England, and in other places. This uh, peace method of investigation is an alternative approach to interviewing witnesses and suspects in a criminal investigations and is primarily used in England. The peace model places a strong emphasis on building rapport and trust with the suspect, as well as obtaining accurate and reliable information through open-ended questioning and active listening. The acronym PEACE stands for P for planning and preparation. Before conducting the interview, investigators must carefully plan and prepare by gathering information about the case, assessing the available evidence, and developing an interview strategy. E, E for engage and explain. The first step in the interview is to engage with the witness or suspect, establish rapport, and explain the purpose and nature of the interview. Investigators should also explain their role and the process of the interview. Account, clarification, and challenge. So A for account, the next step involves encouraging the witness or suspect to provide a full account of their involvement or knowledge in the case. Investigators may use open-ended questions to elicit information, seek clarification of details, and challenge any inconsistencies or contradictions in the account. Closure. Once the interview is complete, the investigator should summarize the information obtained, clarify any remaining issues, and thank the witness or suspect for their cooperation. E is for evaluation. After the interview, the investigator should evaluate the information obtained, assess the credibility of the witness or suspect, and determine the next steps in the investigation. So, P E A C E. Peace for planning and preparation, engaging and explaining, accounting, clarification and challenge, closure, and evaluation. Let's move on and away from <clears throat> interview styles most commonly used in the judiciary and look at documentary interviews. Oral history and documentary interviews are a method used to gather information from individuals about their experiences, opinions, and perspectives. Now, these interviews can be conducted in a variety of settings, including academic research, journalism, and documentary filmmaking. Conducting an oral history interview re requires careful planning and preparation. Here are some questions to consider when planning an oral history interview. What is the purpose of the interview? What specific information are you hoping to learn or document through the interview? Who is the interviewee and what is their background and experience? What specific knowledge or perspective do they bring to the topic of interest? What is the interviewee's preferred method of communication? Do they prefer in-person interviews, phone interviews, video conferencing? Do they have any special needs or requirements that need to be considered? 
What topics or questions will you cover in the interview? Consider developing a list of questions or general outline to guide the conversation. What equipment do you need to record the interview? Do you have a high quality audio or video recorder? And do you have backup in case you experience technical difficulties? Finally, is your what is your timeline for conducting and transcribing the interview? Do you have a plan for how you will store and preserve the interview for future use? The interview itself. Let's move on to how a standard interview uh, is conducted, the procedure itself. Here are several steps to follow when conducting an interview. Introduce yourself and explain the purpose of the interview. Obtain informed consent from the interviewee, including permission to record the interview and use the information gathered for research or other purposes. Begin the interview by asking open-ended questions to encourage the interviewee to share their thoughts and experiences. Be an active listener, paying close attention to the interviewee's responses and asking follow-up questions to clarify or expand on their answers. Be respectful and sensitive to the interviewee's feelings and experiences and avoid making assumptions or judgments about their responses. Conclude the interview by thanking the interviewee for their time and offering them an opportunity to ask any questions or share any additional information. Transcribe the interview as soon as possible after it is completed while the details are still fresh in your memory. Store and preserve the interview in a safe, secure location, following best practices for archival preservation and management. And by following these steps, you can conduct an oral history interview that is respectful, informative, and valuable for future research and scholarship. How do we know if someone is telling the truth? Now, it's all very well and good to conduct an interview, and but no matter what kind of interview it is, how do you know if you're getting something that is honest and truthful? Determining if someone is telling the truth or not can be challenging as people may lie for various reasons, including to, to protect themselves, avoid punishment, or deceive others intentionally. There's no foolproof way to determine if someone's telling the truth or not. There are some indicators, though, that investigators, attorneys, and others can look for when assessing the credibility of a statement or witness. Some of these indicators include consistency. If the person's statement is consistent with the available evidence, including other witness statements or physical evidence, it's more likely to be truthful. And I want to point out that even though, again, we're kind of returning to that judiciary perspective, uh, all types of interviews uh, can benefit from these basic indicators. Coherence. Look for coherence. A, a truthful statement is usually uh, makes sense and is coherent without any contradictions or inconsistencies. Eye contact. A person who is lying may avoid eye contact or have shifty eyes, whereas someone who is telling the truth is more likely to maintain eye contact. Body language. A person's body language can provide clues to their truthfulness. For example, someone who is lying may appear nervous, fidgety, or defensive, while a, a truthful person may be more relaxed and natural. Emotional response. A person's emotional response can be an indicator of truthfulness. For example, if someone appears to be genuinely upset when recounting a traumatic event, it's more likely uh, that their statement is truthful. Uh, that said, though, personality and cultural indicators can also uh, be or get in the way of these being honest apprehensions of a lie or a falsehood. Just because someone is fidgety doesn't necessarily mean that they're not telling you the truth. In other words, um, they may just be nervous. And just because someone isn't upset after a traumatic event does not mean they weren't traumatized. They may actually still be in a form of shock. All right, memory. A truthful person is more likely to have a clear and detailed memory of an event, while a person who is lying may have difficulty recalling the details or may provide inconsistent accounts of what happened. Motivation. A person's motivation can also indicate truthfulness. For example, if a person has nothing to gain by lying and no reason to deceive, it's more likely that their statement is truthful, unless, of course, they're suffering from some sort of delusion, in which case they're lying to themselves, or if they, for some reason, enjoy lying, which there are those that have compulsion or affinity for falsehood. 
However, it's important to note that these indicators, again, are not foolproof, and other factors can also influence a person's behavior and the accuracy of their statements. Therefore, it's essential to corroborate witness statements with other evidence and to use multiple sources of information to assess the truthfulness of a statement or witness. Let's look at media. Now, uh, media is a bit of a conundrum. We need it to inform us, but just as media informs us, it may manipulate us. So how do we know when media sources are valid or sound? To a certain extent, it's similar to how we know if someone's telling us the truth or not. Very, very much the same processes. Understanding and evaluating media is not unlike the process of conducting an interview. How do we know media sources are sound and valid? Determining the truthfulness of a source of information can be a challenging task, particularly in the era of fake news and misinformation. In some ways, it's similar to deciding if we can trust something that an interlocutor has said. It's almost exactly the same as a matter of fact, and there are some strategies that you can use to evaluate the truthfulness of a source. Consider the source. Is the source reputable and trustworthy? Is it well known, a uh, well-known organization or individual with a history of accuracy and reliability, or is it a relatively unknown or unverified source? Evaluate the tone and language. Does the source use inflammatory or sensational language, or does it present information in a balanced and objective manner? Is the tone of the source designed to persuade or manipulate the reader or to inform and educate? Check for bias. Does the source present a particular perspective or agenda, or is it unbiased and objective? Is there evidence of political, ideological, or commercial bias that may influence the information presented? Verify the information. Can the information presented be verified through other sources or by fact-checking websites? Are there inconsistencies or contradictions in the information presented? Consider the date and relevance. Is the information presented up to date and relevant to the topic at hand, or is it outdated and no longer applicable? Look for supporting evidence. Does the source provide evidence or support, uh, supporting documentation to back up the information presented, or is it based solely on personal opinion or anecdote? Consider the context. Is the source presenting information in a relevant and meaningful context, or is it taking information out of context to support a particular agenda or perspective? By considering these factors and evaluating the source critically, you can ba gain better understanding of the truthfulness and reliability of the information presented. It is important to be skeptical and crit of and critical of sources, particularly those that are new or unfamiliar, in order to avoid being misled by false or inaccurate information. Okay, let's move on to pseudoscience. Identification of pseudoscience. Pseudoscience professes to be justified in terms of the methods of science, but is not actually justified using scientific methods. An ad hoc proviso claim means as needed, while a post hoc means after the fact. Dubious claims tend to use both ad hoc and post hoc justifications, and also generally have three basic features. It is not independently testable. It is not supported by independent ev evidence. And pseudoscience routinely requires additional reasons, ad hoc and post hoc, to save the hypothesis from being disproven. Pseudoscience is an example of a particular type of dubious claim which professes to be justified in terms of the methods of science, but is not actually justified using scientific methods. The following is standard procedure for crime scene investigation. So we're going to move uh, away from pseudoscience and, and try to look at how we avoid being misled in a procedural context for a crime scene, for example. So what, what I'm going to be reading is a very good example of a rational procedure for understanding events that have happened outside of one's purview. First of all, securing the area. The first step in investigating a crime scene 
uh, is to secure the area and prevent any contamination or alteration of the evidence. This includes cordoning off the area, restricting access to the scene, and establishing a perimeter to ensure that no unauthorized individuals can enter the scene. Documenting the scene. Once the area is secured, the investigator documents the scene by taking photographs, sketches, and notes. This documentation captures the initial condition of the scene and location of the evidence. Conduct a walkthrough. The investigator then conducts a walkthrough of the scene to identify potential evidence and assess the scope of the crime. The investigator also looks for any potential hazards or safety concerns. Collect evidence. The next step is to collect evidence. Collecting evidence involves using proper techniques to collect, package, and label evidence. This includes fingerprints, DNA samples, blood samples, and any other physical evidence that may be present. Interview witnesses. The investigator may also interview witnesses to gather additional information about the crime. The investigator should take detailed notes and record the interview if possible. Analyze evidence. The evidence collected at the scene is then analyzed in the laboratory or by forensic as experts. This analysis can provide additional information about the crime and may help identify potential suspects. Revisit the scene. The investigator may need to revisit the scene to gather additional evidence or to confirm initial findings. Report findings. Finally, the investigator documents their findings and prepares a report. This report should detail the evidence collected, any conclusions drawn, and any potential suspects identified. Now, all of this, though quite logistically rational, includes quite a bit of the abductive reasoning process. Uh, Let's go ahead and review what some of the rules for objective reasoning include. Internal consistency. Internal consistency refers to the coherence and logical consistency of a theory or set of beliefs within itself. This means that the ideas and the propositions within the theory should not contradict each other, but rather should support and complement each other in a logical and coherent manner. Just a moment. External consistency. External consistency refers to the ability of a theory or set of beliefs to be consistent with other established theories and empirical evidence. A theory that is externally consistent is able to explain and account for a wide range of empirical observations and is compatible with other theories in the same domain. Testability. Testability refers to the ability of a theory or hypothesis to be tested through empirical observation or experimentation. A testable theory is one that can be falsified or confirmed through empirical evidence and its predictions can be verified or disproven through experimentation. Explanatory scope. Explanatory scope refers to the ability of a theory to explain a wide range of phenomena or observations. A theory with high explanatory scope is able to provide a broad and comprehensive explanation for a wide range of phenomena, while a theory with limited explanatory scope may only be able to explain a narrow range of observations. Conservatism. Conservatism refers to the degree to which a theory or explanation is consistent with established beliefs, theories, and empirical evidence. A conservative theory or explanation is one that does not deviate significantly from existing beliefs and theories and is consistent with established empirical evidence. Simplicity or Occam's razor. Simplicity or Occam's razor refers to the principle that given multiple explanations or theories for phenomena, the one that requires the fewest assumptions um, is usually the correct one. In other words, the simplest explanation that can account for the available evidence is often the most likely explanation.
fruitfulness. Fruitfulness refers to the ability of a theory to generate new research questions and discoveries. A fruitful theory is one that inspires further research and investigation and is able to generate new insights and discoveries that were not previously known or understood. Explanatory power. Explanatory power refers to the degree to which a theory or explanation is able to account for the available evidence and provide a compelling explanation for a phenomena. A theory with high explanatory power is able to explain a wide range of observations and has strong predictive power, while a theory with low explanatory power may only be able to explain a limited set of observations. So back again to what is critical thinking. What is critical thinking in terms of clinical psychologists and or psychiatrists tasked to do an interview? Well, in a clinical interview, uh, one uh, first makes an introduction. The clinician should introduce themselves and explain uh, the purpose of the interview, including the client's goals and expectations for treatment. Gathering background information is next. A clinician should gather information about the client's medical and mental health history, including any previous diagnoses, uh, treatments, or hospitalizations. They may also ask about the client's family history, social history, and current living situation. Presenting a problem, the clinician should ask the client to describe their current symptoms, including the onset duration and severity of their symptoms, they may also ask about any triggers or stressors that may be contributing to these symptoms. Diagnostic evaluation. Based on the information gathered, the clinician may make a preliminary diagnosis or referral for further testing and evaluation. Treatment planning. The clinician should develop a plan for the treatment based on the client's symptoms, goals, and preferences. This may include medication management, psychotherapy, or a combination of both. Active listening. The clinician should be actively listening to the client's responses, taking note of important details and following up with additional questions as needed. They should also use empathy and validation to show that they understand and respect the client's experiences. Confidentiality. The clinician should explain the limits of confidentiality and obtain the client's informed consent for treatment. Closing. Uh, the clinician in closing should summarize the key points discussed and provide the client with an opportunity to ask any questions they may have about the treatment plan or the therapeutic process. Let's make a kind of a quick comparison. Now we've looked at uh, things having to do with clinical, uh, psychological types of medical interviews. We've looked at police interview strategies and judicial interviewing strategies. We've looked at historical oral history, uh, documentary style interviews, uh, a range of interviews. And now I think let's let's compare some key reasoning skills because each of the main professions I'm going to talk about is a different type of key reasoning skill. Now, nursing. Nursing primarily requires inference. Nurses are uh, use inference as a part of their clinical or critical thinking skill set. Nurses make inferences when they gather relevant baseline data and compare them with other information, such as admitting diagnoses, medical history, and knowledge of disease processes. They also make inferences when they examine the extent to which interventions affected the patient outcomes. Criminal justice. Interpretation is the primary key reasoning skill in criminal justice. The capacity to understand and explain the meaning of evidence, such as witness testimony, forensic reports, and other relevant information. Social work. Social work requires cultural competence, the ability to understand and respect the diversity of client backgrounds, perspectives, and experiences, and to incorporate this understanding into practice. Critical thinking in social work practice involves looking at a person or situation 
from an objective and neutral standpoint without jumping to conclusions or making assumptions by, observer, by simply observing, experiencing, and reflecting on all that is happening in context. Social historians. Social historians and documentarians need to understand transcription and analysis. Transcribing the interview, record, re interview recording, analyzing the information gathered, this is, this is the key to being a good historian. This can include identifying common themes and analyzing the interviewee's language and communication style and then drawing conclusions about the topic of the interview. Standard to all critical thinking is curiosity, the desire to learn and seek out new information to better understand the world around us. Thank you.